You see, all of the prophecies, longings, and anticipations under the Old Covenant find their fulfillment, meaning, and culmination in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is the Bible? Well, the Bible is one unified book, but it's also a compilation of 66 smaller books. In other words, there are 66 books that's compiled together in order to make one book. And this book is divided into two large sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, the word testament comes from the Latin word testamentum, and it literally means covenant. So the Bible is really divided into two covenants. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant, known as the Mosaic Covenant, was ratified at Mount Sinai between God and the Jewish nation. You can read all about it in the book of Exodus, starting in chapter 19 all the way to chapter 31. This Old Covenant anticipated and pointed to a New Covenant that would be initiated by the Messiah. Look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 33, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Notice what it says. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them. And I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So in the new new covenant, God promised to put his spirit within us and to impress his word upon our heart. And as I said, the new covenant was to be initiated by the Messiah when he appeared. Look with me, if you would, in the book of Isaiah chapter 49, verses 6 through 9. Because I want you to understand there's more to this new covenant than what Jeremiah talked about. Notice what it says. He says, you. Now, I can't assume that you know who he is or you is. So who is he? God. So God says, you. Is he talking to you? No, he's not talking to you. Who's he talking to? You is the Messiah. So God says, you, the Messiah, will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. Jeremiah said he's going to make a new covenant between God and the children of Israel. Isaiah expounds on that. In fact, he says, God says, you the Messiah will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. I will make you a light to the Gentiles. You see, the Bible classifies all people into two categories. Jews and Gentiles. If you're not a Jew... You're a Gentile. It doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter where your ancestors are from. You're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. So he says, you will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. The Messiah is going to do more than that. He says, I will make you the Messiah like to the Gentiles. And you will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. The Lord, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel says to the one who is despised and rejected by the nations... Who was despised and rejected? Jesus Christ. Talking about Jesus. The Lord, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel says to the one who is despised and rejected by the nations, to the one who is the servant of rulers. This is going to be a different kind of ruler, the Messiah. He's going to be a ruler who rules for the good of the people. He is going to be a servant. In fact, when we see Jesus, he's totally different. And he tells his disciples, you don't understand who I am. I'm a servant. But at the last supper, he did something that shocked them all. He took off of his clothes. He wrapped himself in a towel and began to wash his disciples' feet. And he said, I am the servant Messiah. Then he goes further. To the one who is the servant of rulers, kings will stand at attention. When you, the Messiah, pass by. Princes will also bow low because of the Lord, the faithful one, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. This is what the Lord says. At just the right time, I will respond to you. On the day of salvation, I will help you. I will protect you. Now, this little passage right there, 
At just the right time, I will respond to you on the day of salvation. I will help you. I will protect you. Is referring to the Messiah's time between the cross and his resurrection. If you remember, it says, or right here, it says, at just the right time, I will respond to you. Why does he say that? Because when Jesus was on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In other words, God's response was to turn his back upon Jesus because Jesus was made our sin. And at that point, he was condemning sin in Jesus' flesh. This is his promise to him. On the day of salvation, which was the day he was resurrected, I will help you. I will turn back to respond to you. I will protect you. And then he goes further. And I will give you to the people as my covenant with them. In other words, he's saying God is going to give the Messiah to the people as God's covenant with them. Now, we probably don't understand what he's saying, so let's go back to what Jesus said. Look with me, if you would, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 25. Notice what this says. This is at the Last Supper. Jesus is initiating the new covenant. It's going to be actually initiated through his death, burial, and resurrection. And the Last Supper is a time for him to show exactly what he's going to do so his disciples will understand it. So in 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 25, he says this. In the same way he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, those who are saved. If you receive Jesus. So this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Where's he getting that? Isaiah chapter 49 verses 6 through 9. He says, and he will give you to the people as my covenant with them. Through you I will establish the land of Israel and assign it to its own people again. So if any of you have been taught replacement theology, that's wrong. One of the purposes of the millennium is to actually fulfill all the promises that were made to the Israelites. They will actually have every bit of land that God promised to them. And Jesus will rule from Jerusalem during the millennium. I will say to the prisoners, come out in freedom and to those in darkness, come to the light. In other words, go from death to life, from sin to righteousness. They will be my sheep grazing in green pastures on hills that were previous previously bare. So in essence, the Old Testament was meant to prepare us for the appearance of the Messiah who would initiate this new covenant. And the New Testament is all about the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and the new covenant that he initiated with us. Now, the Old Testament is made up of 39 books, and the New Testament is made up of 27 books. When you put all that together, there are 66 books. In fact, the Bible was written over a span of 1,500 years by over 40 different authors. The Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, was written around 1400 B.C. by Moses. And the last book of the New Testament, which is the book of Revelation, was written sometime around 90 A.D. by the Apostle John. That's why I say that this Bible, this book here, it's a compilation of 66 books. It was written over a span of 1,500 years by over 40 different authors. And they all are speaking about the same thing. So, what's the purpose of the Bible? Well, in a nutshell, it's to bring us to Jesus Christ so that we can be saved. In other words, so we can go to heaven. You see, all of the prophecies, longings, and anticipations under the Old Covenant find their fulfillment, meaning, and culmination in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look with me, if you would, at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. It says, for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ. Now, is Christ a name? No. Christ is a title. We kind of think sometimes when we say Jesus Christ that Jesus is his first name. Christ is his last name. That's not the case. Christ is a title. It comes from the Greek word Christos. It means the anointed one, the Messiah. So when we say Jesus Christ, what we are saying is Jesus, the anointed one, Jesus, the Messiah. But what this is saying is for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in the Messiah. And who is that Messiah? Jesus. And then it goes further with the resounding yes. And through the Messiah or Christ, our yes ascends to God for his glory. 
Now, does everyone understand the last part of this verse? Probably not, so let me explain it to you. What it's saying is that when we finally realize that Jesus has fulfilled all of the messianic prophecies by dying on the cross to pay for our sins and by giving us eternal life through his resurrection, we shout, yes, yes, Jesus, yes, you are my Lord, you are my Savior. Now, if you got saved, you probably didn't do that on the outside, but you probably did on the inside. When you finally realized who Jesus was, what he had done for you, inside you're going, yes, I want Jesus. Yes, I want to make him Lord of my life. Yes, I want him to be my Savior. And that's what this is talking about, which is the glory of God. So the goal of the Bible is to bring its readers to receive the forgiveness of God in Christ Jesus, thereby giving us eternal life. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 15, and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about because this says it word for word what I'm saying, except in a better way. Notice what it says. You have been taught by the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. Wow. Let me read that again. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood. And they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. See, it's the Holy Scriptures that give us the wisdom to receive salvation by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's its ultimate purpose, to bring us to Jesus Christ so we can be saved. Now, I told you in the introduction of this sermon that I can no longer use theological terms like saved, redeemed sanctified without first explaining what it means. So what does it mean to be saved? So many of you sitting out here, grown up in church all your life, if you went to the Baptist church, you've heard that term all of your life, saved. Are you saved? And you know, you kind of gleamed what the meaning was. But if I asked you to define it, you probably couldn't. And if I said, what are we saved from? Most of you would say hell. But actually, that's not correct. What are we saved from? We are saved from our sin. Romans tells us for the wages of sin is death. Hell is simply a consequence of us being sinners. So what Jesus had to do is he had to pay the penalty for our sin and in some way transform us to be righteous so that we wouldn't have to pay the consequences of our sin. So when we say that we're saved, what we're saying is we're saved from our sin but more importantly, from the consequences of our sin, which is, and you're right here, hell. And hell is only a temporary holding place because every person will be resurrected. The righteous will be resurrected before the, before the millennium begins. The damned will be resurrected at the end of the millennium. They stand before God in what is known as the great white throne judgment. And they're judged out of the things written in the books. And why are they judged out of the things written in the books? Because they didn't receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. In essence, what they told God is, I don't want Jesus to pay for my sin. I'll pay for my own sin. And you will if you don't receive Jesus. The only problem is you can never quite fully pay for your own sin. And you'll never be righteous. And God can't give you eternal life if you're not righteous. Well, pastor, are you saying you're righteous? In Christ Jesus, I am. Jesus has saved me from my sin. He's paid the penalty from my sin. But not only that, in Christ Jesus, I am made the righteousness of God. Not by what I've done, but by what Christ has done. His righteousness, as Romans says, has been imputed to me. 